When I was a kid, I mean, you know, when we were growing up in the 1950s, just about every movie that was ever made was either a cowboy movie or a war movie. And we used to go to the Saturday afternoon matinee and swap our comics and things like that, and then, you know, and then go and sit through the movie. And I was fascinated. And, and obviously, you know, I mean, you know, the horrors of war, not something you want to encourage anybody to get into. And you only understand that once you've actually got in the middle of it. But it was always such an adventurous existence. And I got my head around this as a young kid, you know, wanting, and I used to watch these movies and think, oh, wow, that would be awesome. By the late 1960s, when I left school, Everybody who is an able-bodied male left school and went to the army for your for your national service. Uh, you either did that or you ducked the country or you made an excuse that you're going to university. And, but you didn't really get away with it. Everybody got caught. I mean, every single person, every every friend of mine, every member of my family, every everybody I knew was called up and went and did service in the army. I, I was still with a nine monthers. Eventually it went to two years in the later parts of sort of trying to defend the South African system. There was a friend of my brother's. His father was a friend of my father's. And he came to stay with us over a weekend. And he was, he was a parabat. And he staunched in there and he was a, a bright guy with his bat and, you know, his wings. And, and I thought, wow. You know, I was totally, and I was probably about 16, I suppose. I thought, well, when I go to the army, I'm going to be a paratrooper. And when I went into the army, we, we, I went to Bloemfontein and we, were, we, you know, we went and did our roof camp, as they called it. And our roof camp with our first three months of basic recruit course cut short because we were the last of the nine months in our intake. The, the next bunch of guys were going in for a year. And in order to clear the decks and make sure that space was a bigger intake, they had to get rid of us. So we only did seven months as opposed to the normal nine months. And so we only did a, a month of roof camp. And that was at SSB, but it was also home to the Army Division. We did them our month there, and then, you know, as is always the case, they then brought people, you know, personnel from different Army branches. One batch of guys came along there, and these really tough-looking guys, and they were maroon berets and big moustaches and things like that, which is quite fashionable amongst the certainly the instructors in those days. You used to have these great big bloody handlebar moustaches. And this really tough batch of guys, and they pitched up and said, right, who wants to be a better batch? You know, I put my hand up straight away. And a bunch of other guys did as well. And they sort of formed us up and then pointed to a gomo or a little mountain, which was about 200 miles away. So we had to run to this gomo and come back. And it wasn't 10, I think it was half an hour really, and get back within that space of time. Anybody who didn't cross the line within that period was automatically dismissed. We went there, were then taken to the parachute battalion um, uh, barracks. And then it started, and it was a PT course, it was a two-week PT course, where you did nothing all day but run and jump and climb over obstacles, and obviously a lot of other guys have dropped out of that. And, I, and there were so many times when I said, what am I doing here? This is stupid. I mean, <laughs> I mean an idiot would be doing this to himself. At the same time, it sort of made this commitment to myself, and I'd also told a lot of people who didn't believe me I was going to be a parabat, and there was no way as I was going back to Sibby Street not being a parabat, so I sort of stuck it out. And that was really more mental thing than a physical thing. But although it was his, I mean, we just straight out of school, we'd been playing rugby, doing athletics and so on. So physically, we were pretty fit and young. So, you know, you could put up with that kind of thing. But there's a lot of mental strain as well, because, you know, that kind of thing, you've got to keep pushing yourself to say, I'm not going to give up. These guys are not going to break me. And I suppose you need that kind of psyche. And I, and I managed to get through it. But I must say that the... The, the, the outcome of the of, of the Parabat experience was wonderful. We got to jump out of aeroplanes, perfectly service of aircraft, you flight. You know, we spent a lot of time in the rifle range. Didn't do much in the way of weapons training even really, you know, but it was a very physical thing. And then every now and again they'd say, right, tonight we're going to jump. Two of our jumps were done out of a Dakota. And on two occasions we got to jump out of the C-130, which is a Hercules. We, we finished that uh, our Parabat period, my, my national service. We ended at the, the Bloemfontein show, the silent draw parade. It was this total precision. And there was a, a group of us, there were a group of uh, 21 of us. And so we spent a lot of time practicing for that. And it went off absolutely fantastically. Jeez, we were all over the news and what have you. You know, much later in my in, in, in my military experience, we, we there was a colonel who came and gave us an address at the SAS when we, when we moved from Cranbourne Barracks to, to Cabrit. When he came to the halt it sounded like a car crapping on cement because nobody got their timing right. I remember our governor Coventry, who was a former commanding officer from way back when, and he came and he did a talk. He said, well, gentlemen, I'm very pleased to notice that your, your drill is still up to shit. The first time the SAS win a drill parade, I'm going to hand in my wings. 
the deal was basically, you know, well, you know, it's nice to know that you guys are still, you, you had to do a job in March, you're not, a, not part of it. But whereas with the Parabats, um, there was a guy by the name of Pepe van Zeil, and he was a RSM, and he was a guy who was, he had a terrifying appearance about him, although he was actually a very, very nice person. But he was a brilliant drill instructor, and he got us going on that. And I mean, we saw a different side of Pepe completely, because when he wanted to get the cooperation of the men, he had this capability of building up this morale, and he built our morale to the point where we really, really wanted to be so, so part of this thing. There's no duress whatsoever. I mean, we looked forward to that day of two hours of drill, practicing for this thing every day. Well, eventually we got it right. And there was one guy in the middle of the squad who was giving the commands. But, of course, nobody could hear it, nobody in the – because we were right in the middle of the arena. And, yeah, then I went back to Civvy Street. I joined the Joburg Stock Exchange, and I was there for – you know, as soon as I sort of started with, with the company I was with, I started doing the CIS. And then the, the, the whole stock exchange, this whole boom, just came to grinding halt. Guys like myself were sitting on the floor twiddling our thumbs doing nothing. And the result was that a lot of people were retrenched. I needed to finish my CIS, uh, which I did. Um, I had this idea that I needed to go and spread my wings overseas. I packed my togs and, and, and got an airplane and went to London. I continued to have this fascination for military. And I used to read things on military. I, I had a, this romantic image of these war heroes. And then, you know, movies like Kelly's Heroes came out. And there were other movies like Green Beret. And, and I used to hang on these movies. They were great. And I came back to South Africa and I joined an asset-based finance company and then in 1974, the Angolan struck Mozambique, or the Portuguese crisis really struck. There were massive call-ups. I mean, it was the biggest mobilization of South African troops since the Second World War. I then discovered at that time that I'd been returned to unit from the Parabats because when I made inquiries, I was told, no, 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 sorry, but you're no longer a member of this unit. Anybody who did their training prior to 1970, I got call-up papers to report for duty in January 1976 with the Transvaal Scottish. We then went up to Angola and we spent, well, it was only really about two months because we spent a month at, um, at the Brook. And then we were taken up by vehicle. We drove all the way up and went across to Rukana. We went about 250 k's into Angola. And we took up a position there. And we were then defending what we were doing, defending the draw. And there were armor and there was artillery. And we, what we did is we went, we dug in on main roads and on sort of secondary roads, wherever, wherever our troops were going to be coming back. Our um, job was to secure the line when all the troops and all the equipment and everything else was back and behind us. We would then hold that for two or three days and then we'd move back to a position at which the, where the, all the equipment had stalled and then they would move on and we would stay inside. So we didn't, you know, we didn't see any action. Came back to Civvy Street. The time that uh, the centenary was first attacked in Rhodesia, it was up in the northeast corner, which was still, it was still a police problem. I still considered it to be, you know, just lawlessness. It wasn't, it wasn't warfare. It wasn't terrorism. It was considered lawlessness, where you had splintered groups who was coming and doing hit-and-run jobs on farms. And in 1972, that got quite hectic, and they opened up a military zone called Operation Hurricane up in the northeast of Rhodesia, in the centenary area, up Shamba, right up into the northeast corner, uh, you know, where Zambia and Mozambique and, and Rhodesia meet. I'd been following that. And my father was born in northern Rhodesia. He was born in Livingston, which was northern Rhodesia, became Zambia, obviously. And then he lived in Bulawayo for a lot of his young life. And uh, although I'd never, I'd never even been to the country, but there was just something about the place fascinated me. And it was, it was a looming war fascinated me. And the military side of it, obviously. And I'd heard about the SAS from my came down and joined the South African Army as an instructor. And he actually came to the Parabats when I was doing my national service. And I'd heard about the SAS then. What the SAS were was, uh, it was an offshoot of a group called the Long Range Desert Group, which had formed themselves up in the Second World War. And they were they used to go in small groups and get behind Rommel. Um, that was this little British, little British Army unit. And a guy by the name of David Sterling finally found, you know, he decided that you could do this by parachute. Because what they were doing, they were using vehicles to get in behind enemy lines by taking long routes down and get behind them and then start blowing up their tanks and things like that and do hit and run jobs like that and then get out. And then Sterling decided it should be done by parachute. And I mean, parachuting in those days was also still in its infancy. So 
but they're taking a bit of a chance. I mean, I think that quite a lot of guys got hurt. The Rhodesian SAS, which is called Sea Squadron Rhodesian Special Air Services, was a squadron of 2-2 SAS, which is based in Hereford in the UK, up until UDI. And we were considered a member of the British SAS. We were just an offshoot. And obviously after UDI, that all changed, but they didn't change the name until 1978. And C Squadron Rhodesian Special Air Service became one regiment, Rhodesian Special Air Services, in 1978. And I'd heard about these guys through various places, and I'd looked it up, and I thought, that's me. That's what I want to do. So when the draw to involve myself in the Rhodesian conflict, at that stage I was 25 years old, but I don't know, there was nothing political, nothing racial, there was no emotional draw to the thing, apart from my own sense of adventure. You know, the whole idea of actually going, I didn't even, the thought of actually, actually shooting anybody or being shot at really was like a secondary thought. But the adventure of the whole thing, bullets fly, but nobody really getting hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of thing. It's a bit of a false thing, I think. Um, I came back from Angola, and the company I'd been working for, I'd been offered the position of manager of Germiston branches. So they sidelined me, and they put, so employed a guy from outside the company, and they put him into the, into the job. Rather spontaneously, I said, right, guys, you can take your job and shove it. I left, and I went and did something else for a couple of months, and I hated it. But all the time... This Rhodesian thing was playing on me. I was watching the developments and I read everything in the newspapers and listened to the news broadcast. Then they did they did a big raid into a place called Mapai in Mozambique. And that was all over the newspapers. And I just there was just something about all this adventure. And that's what I that's what I considered adventure. Yeah. There's something that was burning inside me. Oh. Just said, you've got to go. So did you think about because you're twenty five years old now? Did you think about that selection process and the, how tough it's going to be? Were you in pretty good shape? Did you train for it or were you ready for it when you went? One of the things about the Rhodesian Army, particularly the SAS, was, well, with the SAS, you needed, at that time, right, when I first joined, you needed to have previous military experience. And I was able to fob off my Wayne Golden experience as previous military experience. Uh, they, they normally took guys from within the ranks of places like the RLI and the Grey Scouts and, and other Rhodesian units. If you'd, if you'd served for a year or more. But when you went into the SAS training troop, you started from day one. One of said is that whatever military experience you have in the past, wipe it away. Forget you ever had it because we're going to teach you what you need to know, not what you think you should know. But And part of that was a fitness training course. You had a guy by the name of Pat Flannery. He was a former American Marine who had been in Vietnam and so on. But he, his job was a PTI, as a physical training instructor, and he was bloody good at what he did. You know, he was able to ease you in. And when we first got to training troop, it was 4.30 in the morning, you got up, you, you basically formed up at 5 to 5, because 5 o'clock was the time, 5 minutes before the time was on time, and then we'd go for a run. We'd go for an easy run, probably do about you know, 4 or 5 k's, at a pace which was quite legit and quite, quite easy. But gradually, as that went on, so the pace intensified and the sense of fitness intensified. But we do that in the morning, and in the afternoon, we we're going to go down to the RLI fields, which are not far away from the Cranbourne Barracks where we were based. And we do two hours of PT, which was, you know, not also not big heavy stuff, carrying a guy in the fireman's lift for 100 meters, and he'd carry you back. And then you'd do a couple of sit ups and push ups and run around the field a couple of times and so on. But everything that we did during the day was always at the double. So we'd be, you know, we'd be doing mortar drills, for example. So you'd be setting up a mortar and, 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 and then taking it down and then running to the next position, setting it up again. And, so and that would be, you know, that would be a two-hour session of training. And you'd go back and there'd be something else. And, and all the time, without even, even realizing it, the whole physical fitness thing was creeping in and basically toughening you up. And for the first time, I came, came back to visit my folks at the end of our, our first batch of training, just before going to the bush. I got a week's leave and I came down here. And nobody could believe my, the transfer. I, I didn't even notice the transformation. Everybody said, Jesus, you're so fit. You're so, you know, so, I mean, this is almost all. Huh? And I suppose it because, I mean, your muscle tone was right. I mean, that was just something that was kind of eased into you. 
So how long was that training course? That initial training was eight months. There were two phases to it. We started at Cranbourne Barracks, which was uh, at the SAS training troop, which was a little, it was a sort of an area separated from separated from the barracks themselves. But three there was three rows of barrack rooms where they would house, you know, each barrack room would house a hundred guards and everybody. And so we were there and got on board vehicles and we'd go out to the bush and we'd do anti ambush drills and like that. But the initial stages of it was really a lot of weapons handling rather than any specific tactical training or anything like that. We learned blindfolded. You'd have to – they'd strip down four, four weapons in front of you, and by feeling you'd have to decide which weapon belonged, which part belonged with which, with which weapon, and reassemble all four weapons with a blindfold on you, having randomly picked up bits and pieces here, there, and everywhere. So it was that kind of thing. You know, and the, the, and it was all really designed to make you f- familiar with weapons. And were those just your weapons or – were they enemy weapons? No, were no, they... enemy we, we used a lot of enemy weapons because the, the standard weapon that was used by the Rhodesian Army was the FN, which is supplied by the Rhodesian, by the South African Army, or the R1 as it became known, and the G3. And the G3 was effectively a, a, an improvement on the 303 rifle. Eventually they changed it to fit a 7.62 round, but they had been effectively the G3 was just a, a semi-automatic 303 originally. And but we used the, the weapons that we used was like the SKS, the AK-47, the RPD. These are all infantry-style weapons. And then a lot of other weapons, uh, the heavy weapons, the anti-aircraft weapons, like for example, 14.5 anti-aircraft weapons, 12.7 um, weapons which were mounted in the back of vehicles and things like that. We learned all those things. You know, every you know, and then crossbows. And then we'd be taken out to the range. We'd go and do, you know, go and fire all these weapons, and they have to strip them down, clean them, put them back together again. Other than just getting us very fit, the first sort of two and a half months, three months, was more weapons training and familiarization with weapons of a different sort. Bear in mind that you know any parachute regiment are essentially infantry because you know it's just your mode of transport. But once you're on the ground, you're just a foot soldier. Knowing your infantry weapons was quite important. The Rhodesia is always strapped for cash. So, you know, the more weapons we could get from the other guys, the better. So we used to get these huge arms caches found and we'd bring them with all their ammunition and so on. The, the ones that we, we used more than any of the others was AK-47, SKS, which was a, which was a very similar, was also a Russian-made weapon. In fact, it was a Chinese-made weapon, the SKS. It was very similar to the AK, but it was a Chinese and then the RPD, which was which was a, a light machine gun, you used to have a drum with a hundred round belt wrapped up in the drum. So we'd use all those weapons, and you know, over and over and over and over again. Sorry, which of those weapons did you prefer? Which which did you find was the best weapon? One I, I never gave up on was the FN. I used an AK-47 on several occasions, but when we were on deployment and in the bush, I carried an FN. I never carried anything else. Um, the reason for it was because. One of the things, an, an AK is, well, for one thing, it's got, a, it's got a lower muzzle velocity. Muzzle velocity of an AK-47 is only 2,300 feet per second. It's a slightly lighter weapon, but it's also got a 30-round magazine as opposed to a 20-round magazine for the, which in many ways you can probably say, well, that's why would you rather have the, the smaller magazine? Well, the AK had a strange change lever. In other words, when you... When you changed your, your action on your weapon from, from single shot to, to, to automatic, the automatic was on first click, and, the, and, and single shot, the USA had safety, which is right at the top, then you had automatic was the first click, and semi-automatic was the, third, was, the, was the second click, which quite often, you know, in the heat of the moment, you put that thing onto automatic, and you pull the trigger. It fired five, five, 600 rounds a minute, so it's 10 rounds a second, and you know, Two seconds, your finger on the trigger, and, you, and you're blown away, and it's just a waste of ammunition. Also, the, the, the change lever on the AK was on the right-hand side of the weapon. So when you wanted to use it as a right-hander, you've got your, your, you're holding the, holding the stock with your left hand and the trigger with your right hand. You have to move your right hand forward to click down your change lever. Now, not that you had your weapon on safety while you're walking around the bush, but it was, they were just features that didn't appeal to me. 
And in training, you know, for example, you'd in, we used to have coup shooting competitions. So we'd be walking down like Jungle Lane. And Jungle Lane, what they used to do, used to walk and they used to pop up targets. You, used to have, you have to have your weapon on safe while you're walking down this. So you walk down, then you'd have to change it. And I mean, the number of times you didn't quite get that click because those targets are only there for, you know, they pop them up and pop them down again. The idea was you had to shoot at them while they were still up. So you have to move your hand forward, click the thing, you click your weapon on, bring your hand back to the trigger and fire. And if you didn't get it dead right, you'd fire off 20 rounds before you knew it because you'd click the thing onto automatic. That was one of the downsides of the AK, and I never, ever liked that. Also, trigger mechanisms on those AKs were very erratic. For some reason, I think every, every AK I ever fired had a different trigger pressure. You know, sometimes you touch the trigger, the bloody thing would fire, and the next thing you'd have to squeeze like all oh, oh, hell to get the thing to go. Whereas the, whereas the FN, or the R1, which is a South African-made weapon, was a far more reliable, far more robust weapon, and also had a greater was a muzzle velocity, it had a 2,700 feet per second muzzle velocity. And also you could actually hold a stock and your 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 change lever was where your thumb was. You know, if you're, if you're holding the pistol grip, you could actually click your thing down onto position, and your first position was single shot or semi-automatic. And you really had to push it hard to get it onto automatic. Using a rifle on automatic is just a waste of ammunition. You're never, ever going to, you know, the thing's going to ride up, and you've got no accuracy. So, Ian, you did this eight-month course, and then you went into the selection process. Did people drop off during that eight months? The first phase was actually in, in two separate phases. The first three months... We were at Cranbourne, and we did, as I say, a lot of that weapons, um, weapon handling and weapon familiarization. So a lot of guys dropped out in those early stages, A, because there were things like, you know, sort of injuries from PT, not not serious injuries, but, you know, guys who, who weren't as fit as they could have been, maybe, and even the light sort of PT, the easing into the kind of PT we were doing, you know, a guy gets shin splints or, or twisted ankle or something like that. Was, they were also very, very strict. You know, we uh, strictly one way, which is, you know, set us aside from the South African army, because in the South African army, everybody was considered a block from Saroof, and the guy that was in charge of you had one mission and one mission only, that was to make your life as miserable as hell. And if you couldn't, you'd find a reason to do it. Whereas the Rhodesian army is slightly different. So certainly as far as the SA is concerned, I can't talk for other units. They used to put up a roster at the beginning of the week, what our training program was going to be for the week. You're on a notice board? And say, right, this week, this is where we're going to go. The equipment you're going to need is going to be this. You're going to need a water bottle. You're going to need webbing of this, no, da, 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 weapons and so on. Five minutes before the time is on time. And every single exercise had a time on it. Now, something that they did very early on was anybody who got there late, gone. You just didn't, you just didn't come back from that. So it, it got people thinking, this is, you know, um, you know I mean, we messing around and – We'd better get there, guys, something. And one guy says, I'm just going to go take a leak. And he went off. We had all gone off. He came trilling back literally three minutes later. He said, where have you been? Five minutes before the time is on time. Told you're late. Get. And that was the end of him. Never saw him again. You were basically out. You were immediately sent off the course. So there was that kind of thing, you know. But they used to give us the, they gave us the, the scope of saying, think for yourself. Don't ask us to do your thinking for you. And if you can't be there on time, you're not thinking for yourself. If you've got to be bloody bullied and coerced and so on, then you know you don't belong here. And that was the way it went. So for those reasons, you know, guys would drop out. A lot of guys just, I think, you know, because we got lectures. You know, we used to get night lectures. Aside from the days access and things like that to be uh, the day's activities we used to do. We had then have lectures from seven o'clock until nine o'clock at night. And they taught us about the poli- the history of Rhodesia, which was big, the politics of the time, who the who the political commissars were of the opposition, wh- whatever information they had which was not sort of highly secretive, because obviously you know they, we we still weren't sort of privy to any sort of secrets or anything like that. And, and recent events, you know, things that have, that have happened uh, where they had caught a political commissar working as a gardener for the major, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. You know, and we'd get, we'd get that kind of information. We'd, we'd get his background, where he came from, who he was, et cetera, and who he commanded. So we got all that kind of information thrown at us as well. And I think there were a couple of guys thought, mm, do I really want to get this deeply involved with this thing? You know, because, so then they would drop out voluntarily. 
And then when we left Cranbourne to go to a place called Gwai River, which is up near Wanky, it was an old crow mine, but the, but the village, the mine village is still there. And the SAS adopted that as, as their training ground, their training school. So we went and lived in the mine houses there and it just had all the facilities you needed. It had a canteen, it had everything. So And it was also right deep in the bush. It was, you know, there's nothing, you know, close by, no shops. We were taken there to do the next phase. And at the time, it, unbeknown to us, right the way through this first phase, every one of us was being monitored for attitude, for mentality, for, you know, how we responded to certain things and so on. And they pulled about 20 guys out of it and said, chap, sorry, but you're not coming with us to Gwai. And they were gone. You know, we never really found out the intricate reasons why. There were reasons that they had established that these guys weren't going to fit. And then we went to Gwai, and then from Gwai, and in Gwai we did all the sort of tactical type of stuff. A lot of anti-ambush drills, uh, all the kinds of things that you would likely run across in a contact situation. You know, it was a guerrilla war, so no, no matter where you were, your chances are pretty good you could run into an ambush or whatever. But also what we learned a lot about was house clearing, attacks on, on, on barrack rooms and things like that. So Ian, when you started, you had 523 guys on the course and you now did eight months of training. How many did you lose through the training part? And then how many people got onto the final selection? And then how many dropped off through that period? John, just, just let me put this into perspective. There were never 523 guys on the course. Overall, 523 came through it. I'll tell you how it worked. We, we started um, in training trip. We started with, I think there were 300, um, there were just over 300 guys, okay, who we started in that sort of set up with that, at the uh, SAS training trip. Guys dropped out from that. And we went then went up to Gwai. Now, we were then joined by guys from other units who had done basic training in the town and, and they wanted to now come and be part of the SAS operation. They volunteered, but they'd done basic. So they then joined us when we went up to Gwai. So our numbers actually swelled from, from what was left out of the training troop guys from, and I can't remember what the numbers were, but I think we were. I think we were left with about 170 guys from the original 300 odd that we started with. Uh, the numbers were then boosted back up to close to 300 to, to come up to Guai, and then we went in and, uh, and at Guai we did all you know all the sort of uh, tactical training and things like that, you know, map reading, all all the kind of stuff that you are likely to do. But you know, the overall training. During that period, there were quite a lot of dropouts as well because you know, it was still hard work. And there were guys who were earmarked by the instructors, et cetera, to say, look, you know, you're not the material for this operation. You know, you need to be out of here. And they would drop out. Uh, you know, it was during the training phase, there were guys who were called who said, look, you know, you're not, you're not going to make it. You're not, you're not the kind of material we need. Uh, you know, you, you, you're late on parade. You know, you just, you know, you know we, 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 we need... And, and, and guys were sent off. And then when we had finished at Guai, we all went back to Bulawayo. The guys that were left on the course went back to Bulawayo, we went to Llewellyn Barracks, um, and that's when the selection proper started. And then we were joined by a lot of guys who had come in from other units, for example, Salu Scouts, um, guys who wanted to transfer. They would still have to come and do our selection. There would be guys from Grey Scout, which was uh, the uh, mounted infantry, those were the horse guys, RLI, etc. And these were all, you know, sort of well-trained and, and um, guys who had actually been in combat who wanted to transfer and transfer into the squadron. They would then join us. They joined us in Bulawayo for, for selection. We hadn't seen any of these guys before throughout our sort of training phases. The start of selection, I think we, I think we started selection there's about 230 guys to get all together. But the, the total number of guys who came through our course from day one until the end, there were 523, I remember that number, there were 523 in total from the start out through guys who have been dropped out, new guys came in, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. When we actually started selection, there were, 200, there were about 230, 240 thereabouts. I'm not, I'm not sure how many? Well, when I saw, it was in that region. I'm not sure I'm jacked of the exact number. It was around about 230, 240. And those are the guys that actually sort of formed up at the time when they said, right, anybody who wants to leave, it's now a good time for you to do so because you don't want to go through this pain for nothing. And you know, it was, that was the sort of advice that we were given. Because from that point on, there were only two guys at the end of selection who actually told, look, 
you know, maybe you should try try the next one. You're not going to make it. You know, when they started selection, we started with what they called the pre-rev. It's a 36-hour period where you are constantly in motion. It's constant activity. There is no sleep, no food, and rationed water. And that started at <laughs> 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning. I'll never forget it. And they formed us all up and said, right, guys, this is the beginning of your main selection. I would suggest anybody who's got doubts about their ability to go through this thing, but now's a good time to leave because um, this is not going to be pleasant. It's not designed to be pleasant. It's designed to get rid of you. Um, and they told us that quite clearly. Did anyone leave at that stage? No, 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 no. But I mean, within, within an hour or two, guys are starting to drop out. Started out just by a gentle road run. And now bear in mind that you, on full, well, in full kit, you're in full denim and, and fatigues, carrying a rifle and you're carrying a brick. And that brick has introduced you as your lover for the period. That's one of those stupid things. This will not leave your side. You will be looking after this, this you will nurture it and all that. Your rifle is one hand and a brick in another hand. And that's what you used and you could carry it for that entire 36 hour period. They put us into a field, we were playing soccer. Other guys were running around. And we're different squads because obviously you couldn't have 230 guys on a, on a football field. Not that it, it, you know, the 230 very, very rapidly started to diminish. And by the end of the first 12 hours, we were down to probably about 70 or 90 guys thereabouts. Going through from 9 o'clock in the morning, you're now into 9 o'clock at night, and you are, it's, it's, it's only 12 hours gone. By this time, you bag it because, as I said, it was constant motion. There was nothing hectic that was sort of going to really exhaust you. But, well, there were bouts of it because, for example, there's a mud, you know, the Llewellyn Barracks was a big barrack area. They had sports fields and they had swimming pools and they had all that sort of thing. And there was one area which was a swamp, and we'd go into the swamp. Now, you, you're in your kit, you've got your brick, you've got your rifle, and then they'd allow you to put your rifle and what have you down, but you're into the swamp, and it was a mud fight. And you had to bag it, and then you come out, and you're covered in mud, and then you carry on. There's no way you're going to go and have a shower. So you're uncomfortable, you're inevitable, and, you know, and so it goes. And then, you know, they'd put a, a tug of war, for example, and competitions, and they'd break into two. And this would go on and on and on. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, they say, listen, guys, I'll tell you what, we're not going to tell anybody this. You know, the boss has gone to sleep. We're going to give you guys a couple of hours of sleep. You guys have done really, really well. And at that time, you are absolutely exhausted. I mean, yes, and they would give you literally 10 minutes just because you weren't going to do Nobody took any time in falling asleep. Everybody, I think, was out like a light in a second. And in 10 minutes, in that, get up, get up, get up, you know, and blowing whistles and hooting horns and things like that. And at that stage of the game, about 10 guys said, you guys, you guys carry on without me. I'm not going to do this. And it was that kind of thing. But it was a whole sort of psychological breakdown, physical breakdown. So, and then you, you'd be marched past a mess at, at 7 o'clock in the morning when there's bacon being cooked, things like that. You know, you weren't going to get any of that. And then you'd be given a, a, a cup of water. But gradually the numbers diminished. And by the time we got to the end, which was 9 o'clock on the Sunday night, they said, all right, guys, you can all – and they gave us a meal. It was bloody ration packs. It wasn't even a decent meal. Gave us ration packs and uh, broken down, and then they immediately chucked us in the back of vehicles and took us out into the Matopas. And it was pitch black. We couldn't see where we were going. In fact, it was the back of the vehicle anyway, so we couldn't see. The guys that were left, at that stage of the game, I think there were 20, 20 guys left. Of We've gone from 9 o'clock on Saturday morning right through Saturday night into Sunday and into Sunday night. So now we are now basically we are 36 hours gone, and there's not a – I mean, and – John, you want to know exhaustion. It's just absolutely unbelievable. And, and, you know, at that point in time, everybody is saying, what do I do? Why am I doing this? You've still got your brick, you've still got your rifle, and you've still got your sanity to some degree. But, you know, you can just see how the numbers were just diminished under those circumstances. We were then had to go and collect our kit, which is all our Bergens and that sort of thing. And we loaded them onto the back of the vehicles. And it drove us out, and that's about about 50 k from Bulawayo to, to, to the sort of core of the Metopus. And they, went, they just dumped us there, chucked us two maps and said, right, we, this is a grid reference, which they wrote down on a piece of paper. 
you guys will be there tomorrow by six o'clock. Those who are not there will not be staying with us. And then they just disappeared into the darkness with the vehicles and left us there. And of course, the first thing you do is get your head down for some sleep. And the first thing in the morning, the first light, you then had to identify, had to locate ourselves on the map. Because, you know, you, you, we weren't told, we weren't given any idea of where we were. So you've got to actually sort of, by map reading, decide, you know, pinpoint your position. Now, that first phase as well was with a log. It was a tar-stoked tar log. And the, the log was 30 feet long. So we, we had to carry this thing. And I'm trying to walk through Zimbabwe bush or Rhodesian bush with a 30-foot log. You know, because there's no straight lines there. And and that was also, let's see, that was a huge frustration. In fact, there were a couple of tempers flared once it sort of got down to that sort of situation. And, and I think that they were trying to also sort of monitor because at that stage of the game we were on our own. There were no instructors. There were no, at the end of that, then they say, rate your fellow men, the guys that were with you. Who who lost their temper? Who, well, you know, who, who was bloody cursing? Who was doing this? And I say, Tell us, because it's in your interests. We don't, you're not splabbing on anybody. But at the end of the day, these guys are going to be watching your back. So if you feel that you've got a bloody unstable character hanging around, if you want him watching your back, well, that's fine. Be honest. Don't try and cover for a guy who's, who's screwed up on this. And there were very few blokes who actually, in fact, nobody really turned around. The blokes had lost their temper and almost got into a fist fight. Of, uh, just pure frustration. I try to get this bloody log, and we would do it in, in teams. You know, you'd get five guys on the log, and then the rest of the guys would win. That would be for half an hour. And then, then you get to a stay of a place where you couldn't get through, and the map didn't tell you that. You know, on the map, all it did was give you grid lines, um, and but it was like a rock face, and you couldn't take them. And then there was another part where it also wasn't on the map. There was a swamp. I mean, this swamp was, you know, it was like, it was like a marsh. And, yeah, and we had to find a way around that. And, you know, and obviously, you know, tempers were fairly thin. You know, but then we were late for our rendezvous, but we were all late. So that stage of the game, it was a case of them saying, so I say, well, you know, track us all off or, or, you know, sort of keep us here. And they, <laughs> we were making the ultimate, giving the ultimatums, you know. They just said, no, you bloody guys are late. So here's an extra brick. You know, here's an extra brick into our packs. At this stage of the game, now you carry him full pack. And then they broke us up into, into smaller teams. As I say, we, 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 got, we got to our rendezvous, which was, a, which was actually a campsite in, in the Metopus, one of the old you know, places where people used to go there for weekends and time. At that stage of the game, it was abandoned because nobody was going out there because of the security situation. So that's where we ended up, was at this campsite. And then they gave us a decent night's sleep. But we were up again at 4 o'clock the next morning. And then they gave us our tasks for the day. They had to be there, had to be there. And at that stage, again, they took away the detailed maps and gave us a tourist map. We all, we all had these funny little compasses. But, I mean, the, things are, the accuracy of the compasses was actually sort of suspect at best. And then every day they would give us – but they, the, the, the timing – Example, we had to go from this camp we were at, uh, there's a hill, but, and there's a cross right on the top of it. We had to be at that cross by, you know, and they gave us ridiculously short periods of time to get there. And when you got there, you'd be marked off and given your next, your next task. And so you go. And some of the, some of the stuff was done individually, where you were on your own, and others were done in pairs. And that's the way it went for 10 days. And every day, you know, there'd be another task or something more, you know, sort of, Awkward through that terrain in, in the Metopus. And it's very unforgiving that terrain. Most of it is granite, but there's a hell of a lot of really thick bush that grows in those places. And then right towards the end, you'd have the speed march. And the speed march was on, I think it was on day nine. It wasn't, it wasn't the final thing. Everybody kept thinking, you know, it's got to be the last exercise. And it was a 27 kilometer march, the distance from start to finish. But the, it was, the end of it was Solosri. And Solosri is the highest peak in um, southern Zimbabwe. In fact, it's Zimbabwe. And um, it's 1,000 meters, a big part, 1,000 feet, sorry, 1,000 feet off the ground, which, you know, in Vietnam, I don't know how that is, but it's almost a straight slope of, of pure granite. It's like, you know, almost it's like at, a, at an average of about 45 degrees from the bottom to the top. And there's so many false tops to that thing. If you get there, you can't see beyond what you're looking at. And as you get to it, so there's another one. 
and another one. And sadly, you know, and it was, oh, it was frustration. From when you started to the top of Salazri, you had five hours, and it was 27 kilometers. I mean, you're pretty buggy by then anyway. And then um, they would give us an exercise, for example. Oh, yeah, you know, that also happened during pre red they'd, they'd take us out onto the range, and they'd give us uh, give us targets and things like that, and then sort of ask us to do a tactical, uh, give us a plan of tactically taking out that position over there. And they'd tell us what armaments were there. And, and this is at 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever, you know, and you're absolutely stuck. Towards the end, then they gave us an exercise. We had to go and do a reconnaissance of a house um, and then pull back and then attack the house. So that was right at the very end. Um, and then eventually we ended up at a place called the Moth Shrine, which, which, which is quite a, a well-known landmark in the Metopas. And once we got there, they said, right, guys, and they brought out a whole lot of beer. <laughs> there wasn't a single buggy who took a beer, I don't think. We were all just too shagged out. But then they put us back in the vehicles and they took us back to the campsite we were in and everything was laid on there. You know, decent meal and a couple of cold beers and you know, a hot shower. And that was the first time we'd actually had a decent shower. So since, I mean, you're still, you're still caked in mud from the mud pile, you know, and things like that. So the whole exercise was designed to be as uncomfortable as possible to get rid of anybody who they felt was going to be sort of pressurized. You know, I mean, when you're in a situation, you're a four-man call sign and you're under pressure, you're 200 k's away from where you're going to be rescued um, and you've got bad guys chasing you. You know, you need to actually have your wits about you. And that was the kind of thing that they put, why they put you under that kind of pressure. It took a lot out of you. It was not, a, it was not an easy exercise. Then how did you keep going? You know, when you got to that stage where you're thinking, because you must have reached that stage a, a number of times, saying, this is it, I can't continue anymore. How? Did, what did you do to sort of motivate yourself? You know, John, well, if, if, from, from my perspective, it was something which I, I was challenging myself more than anybody else. You know, I'd had this bloody dream about being one of these bloody yahoos since I was a kid. It, it became a sort of a self-challenge for me. I mean, I'm not talking about anybody else. Everybody's got their own way of motivating themselves. I, I just was not going to let this thing beat me. I mean, there were a number of occasions when I thought to myself, you know, what are you doing? Why? You don't have to do this. But at the same time, I did have to do it. I had to do it for me. I mean, special forces courses throughout the world. I mean, the American SEALs, uh, you know, the, the Marines, uh, you know, the British SAS, They've all got those kind of, of, of selection courses uh, where, you know, they, they break you down physically and mentally. They work you to the very end of your tether, and you've got to find a little bit more to, to, to carry on. All those courses are designed to weed out anybody, to weed out weakness, I suppose, and to, to say, look, you know, well, I'm, I'm tough. And it's not really. It's a, it's a mental attitude more than anything else. Now, bear in mind that we were exceptionally fit. Everybody who got to the point of the beginning of selection had been right through the phase of, 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 our, um, of our training. We, we'd been running almost 12 hours a day and out in the sunshine, eating very good food, getting the right amount of sleep, you know, right through that, that training period. So we were in bloody good shape physically. Whether you can ever prepare somebody for that kind of thing mentally, well, I don't know, but you've got to have your own, your own sense of preparation, I suppose. You know, my mind had been made up right from the beginning, unless I'm seriously injured and cannot carry on doing this thing, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to crack through it. It was exceptionally good against their training, which was exceptionally bad. But they had cannon fodder, they had equipment and and, and one thing I think which was on the side of the bad guys was that they were pretty ruthless. They had no, there was no empathy. There was no, you know, I mean, they, they the kind of guys who would attack a farm, rape the, rape the woman and ban at the babies, that sort of thing. Um, those are the kind of atrocities that were committed by Zandla, no more than, more than by Zipra. You know, and then, of course, you'd get a bunch of really, really angry young men going out after these guys. And on occasions, I think that the atrocities went both ways. We came across a situation once when we'd done a camp attack and I was part of the stay behind party. What we used to do is to go in, clean the place up and then pull back and then leave a stay behind party of a dozen guys 
to monitor the re-infiltration because they always left stuff behind. After a couple of days, we pulled up and an, a, a, an aircraft, one of our aircraft had gone over and it said that there was a bunch of guys sitting under a tree somewhere. And we went, um, we went, when we were pulled out, we had to go and we, the choppers came and lifted us. And we went and um, the, the guy wasn't sitting under a tree, he was hanging under the tree, but from the air it looked like. And he, so, I mean, you know, that wasn't one of the SAS guys, it was one of the guys who had been seconded to a section that was backing us up in a different area. I'm not even going to mention the name of the unit, but it, um, it happened. And I was the guy when cutting, when we cut this corpse down off the tree, and the other guys were, you know, it was, it was ugly. But, you know, how do you cope with it? I think, it, you know, John, as I say, you know, you, your mindset has got to be sort of adjusted to, to, to adapt to, to, where, to your circumstances. And some people have the capability of doing that. I think other people don't. And I look at it, I, I use myself as an example, and, I mean, I still got – now, that, that brotherhood that we develop over time by being in combat with guys is there. And when when I see my mates and they, hey, you know, nobody's sort of all broken and wrecked and, you know, sort of full of remorse and things like that. It was a period of time, period of life, where we were fighting a war. And in war, people get hurt and then, you know, you've actually got to, Defend yourself and, and and attack the other guy to make sure you know. You now they say you know it's 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 very patriotic and noble to die for your country. It was far more sensible to let the other guy die for his. Far more use of war effort by letting to making the other guy die for his cause. And it's a, I suppose it's a very difficult thing to sort of try and even identify with one's own mind. To me, it was. It was a very frightening period. I had a very strong sense of self-preservation. Um, not that I ever turned around and ran, because that was probably the stupidest thing to do. None of our guys ever. We were never in a situation where we were forced to, to retreat. Well, and when I said that, um, when we went into places like, for example, Barajem, um, and we got a huge amount of um, resistance, and then they called in for Limo to support them and so on. And that was another pitch battle. We went on for a while. But we were, the sensible thing to be to was to withdraw. But the guys held the line right to the end you know, and, then, and then pulled out. You, you hear stories about the guys who just basically their nerve breaks under pressure. Well, fortunately, none of the guys that I've served with ever had that problem. Your nerves are stretched to breaking point, but somehow you keep them intact. You know what they say? Anybody who says that they're fearless is actually talking rubbish. Anybody who's not scared under circumstances of combat is either aligned or basically wasn't there. When, when you're, that sort of adrenaline peak is there, the adrenaline seems to have a, almost a calming effect when the action is flying. It's before and after is where you actually really get the emotional buildup and the, and, and the, the, the calming effect of, of, of whatever. I don't know, it's adrenaline, the knowledge that you've actually got to do what you're doing and you're your mind is occupied by staying alive or, or getting rid of the other guy. You know, you know, I just always remember this incredible sort of sense of calm when the shit was in the fan. When I, when I say calm, it wasn't like sort of floating on a cloud. You know, that, that almost a sense of concentration where everything comes together and everything is focused and, and, and you are totally, you know, sort of on top of where you're at. You know, having a situation where you are – the guy next to you, and this happened to me, unfortunately, the guy next to you suddenly just basically drops on the bullet in his head. And that's, that's quite dramatic, but at the same time, not something which is, you know, it, it, it happens. So, therefore, um, I'm, um, and uh, you get over it. It's not a... You know, it's not a. It's, it's not a sort of a. Obviously, everything that you're doing is life threatening. But you, you know, you get over it, and you could be next. But I mean, that's the way it is. The, the SAS never ever operated inside Rhodesia. All our ops were outside of Rhodesia, and they were either doing an observation post. We could be there for three weeks, could be there for a month, could be there for a couple of days. And the plan was used to position ourselves 
on the perimeters of a good camp, round about, you know, up in a bit of a high ground. And then we'd move around. But we used to move in four-man call signs. So if a call sign was, was a group, and our groups were always four men. And you'd have a medic, an explosives operator, a radio operator, and a call sign commander. And a call sign commander knew all of it. So, you know, so those would be your four guys. And, and between us, we would then monitor whatever movement went on inside those camps. You know, are there women and children? What are the weaponry that you is it identifiable? What kind of vehicles? Are, are there vehicles coming in and leaving? Are there groups of men? Are they growing? Are they what is the camp activity? Basically then report back on whatever activity and using that information, they usually quite often turned up in a in, in a camp attack. We would be withdrawn and then we'd formulate a plan based on the information we drew. So Ian, in terms of those monitoring those camps, did you, there were four of you, so did you do four-hour shifts or how did it work? Normally two-hour shifts and then we'd do that into the night and then we'd withdraw and we'd pull away about two or three kilometres so we weren't in the vicinity of the camp. Now occasionally we'd sort of move around and just sort of see if there was sort of activity there was at night, but usually those camps went dead. There was no electricity in any of them or anything like that. No running water, so on. So at night they would pretty much go dead. Sounds like, for example, the sound of vehicles in the distance, you could actually it was picked up at night because you know the air is really still. Even from two or three kilometers away, you'd hear vehicles moving around. And then what we would quite often do in a situation like that is make our way back to go and see what kind of, you know, what activity was happening. With these guys coming in from, a lot of them were serviced by roads that were sort of ground out by the vehicles that were coming and going. As part of the training, we what they would do is they'd take us and drop us somewhere for and say, right, that camp over there, and it wouldn't be a camp at all, but there would be a village. For example, it, uh, what they call TTLs, which is Tribal Trust Land. And there were a lot of villages in those places. Sit and watch it. We would sit and watch this thing, and we'd have to report what was going on inside that village. We were there basically as a training exercise to see how your patients wore up. We used to take books with us to read. Obviously, you had to hide under bushes to do that because a white page in the middle of the bush kind of stands out. It could be terribly, terribly boring. You sit there day after day after day watching what people are doing. And as I say, on the one occasion, we were watching this village, which was totally unsuspicious. And the only reason we were there was because it was to give us the experience of what it's like to sit and stare at a camp for, stare at people for a couple of days. And we, we saw these guys come in, you know, wearing, they, were in red. they never really wore, a lot of them didn't wear uniforms, right? They, they were carrying weapons. We could identify they were AK-47s and one guy in RPD. And so we watched them, we reported back and watched them for a couple of days. And as it turned out, it was actually quite a busy camp these guys were coming in and out. What they were doing is they were, they were going out and um, hitting ambushes, ambushing people, you know, on, on uh, you know, more particularly farmers and or anybody out in the, on, on the rural roads, and then coming back and hiding their weapons and then just being part of the community in the camp. Of course, everybody in the camp knew that, that was happening. So we were able to neutralize that, but that was purely, as I say, it happened more by mistake than it was intention. In those days, did you have night vision binoculars or any of that? Was that technology around then? Yeah, look, they were they, they were in their infancy. We had them, but uh, they weren't very reliable. You know, we'd take a pair and move them, but now, over any distance, they were useless. You know, they, for, for, for close-ups, they were quite good. They certainly weren't the kind of sophisticated equipment that they have today. And then, Ian, besides the observation, what other types of operations did you do? Camp attacks were a big one. Um, also, laying ambushes. Our, our job, basically, in the SAS was more or less what the original long-range desert group, to get behind where the guys were operating and to disrupt their activities as best we possibly could. So what we would do is we would go... In a camp, for example, we'd go and, 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 and lay booby traps around the perimeters of their camp, and then we'd bugger off, and these booby traps would then be detonated. So it disrupted them in the same way as they were trying to disrupt the economy of the country by hitting them, hitting farmers and miners and, and ambushing civilian roads just to break down the morale. We were doing very similar things on a far smaller scale to them because, you know, we would go, for example, it'd be, on one occasion, there was a food truck. We saw the food truck pull in. In fact, there was a convoy of vehicles, and one was carrying quite a lot of food and things like that. Was, we, we noticed that because they started to offload it and then stopped. And we then, at that night, we went and got in the back of that vehicle and put a bunker bomb in the back of it, and then climbed out and disappeared into the darkness. And it was myself and two other guys 
and with, with, with a pull string. So the first guy to get into that vehicle the next morning just blew the whole thing to bits. Laying ambushes. We used to, we used to ambush known routes. There, there were always transit camps. There were some very, very big transit camps, and I can tell you about that just now. There are places like Mapai and Tremoyo and Tembo and places like this where they – they, they, they gathered in mass, and then what, what would happen is that splintered groups would be taken out, and they'd be taken by vehicle in Mozambique, usually taken by Frelimo, because Frelimo supplied a lot of transport to the groups. But uh, some of them had their own vehicles as well. Some, you know, they, they, were, they were pretty poorly equipped to a large degree because um, they didn't have big convoys of, of heavy vehicles and so on. But they would be moved from, for example, somewhere in, in, in the Tet area down towards Mtali or even further south down to the Gonorizo area, a place called Mabaluta, which was quite a big crossing point. And we used to call that the Russian front because the Frelima used to support these guys with tanks. They, used to, they always had their bloody tanks there. But well, what we would do, we would go and, and lay ambush. We would go and lay a mine in the road of known places, and he would sit there and wait for them. And they'd come and uh, obviously put in an attack as an ambush. And uh, once again, it was all really just more disruptive. But then the real heavy stuff, and Chamoya was a perfect example, Mapai was another one. These were very, very heavily populated camps. For example, Chamoya, which was up near, uh, near Baira, the operation was called Opdingo, and there were 3,000 known trained terrorists in that camp, all armed, all trained, all ready for deployment. And over a period of about six months, wreckies were done by ourselves, by Salute Scouts, did a lot of work there. There's one particular guy who got the GCV for his work, but he um, did a lot of loan work. He was a guy who spoke both Cinderbelli and um, Shona absolutely so fluently you couldn't tell that he was a whitey. And he had a shaved head and a blackened face and he used to actually go into the camps and sit around the fire and talk to these guys. He was an incredibly brave guy. He did a lot of the work um, in, in getting the information out and so on. And a lot of the work that we did uh, was, you know, the observation posts. That camp had to be attacked because... They were ready to deploy into Rhodesia, but from going all the way from the north, going all the way down to Mtali and places like that. 3,000 of these guys were about to be deployed into, into Rhodesia. And if the camp had not been allowed to continue, then we would have had a huge internal problem. There was a big internal problem anyway, but it didn't make it any worse. That was the biggest, uh, mind you, now I think the Barry's Gem op later on was bigger, but at that time, the biggest op we'd ever undertaken. We only had 144 men on the ground, and 100 of which, 120 of which were SAS, which was full strength of the SAS at that point in time. That was in November 1977. And there were 24 guys from RLI, every aircraft that was available in the Air Force. And we went in with hunters, canberras, vampires, all carrying bombs. We went in as ground troops, parachuted in, and attacked that camp. That was one of the biggest attacks that we actually did, but we, it, it was necessary. There were huge casualties on the other side. We lost one man, uh, which was quite remarkable. In fact, we lost two. One of the pilots got shot down. One of the guys flying a vampire, and he, he had to do a belly-up landing at Grand Reef, which was near Tali. And as he hit the ground, his, his plane just burst into flames. So he he didn't survive. But talking about the ground troops, we lost one man on the ground. So we were pulled out of that op, and then two days later, we were flown far north to a place called Tembui, which is right up in the sort of Malawi area, just sort of south of Malawi. That was another big camp, but it wasn't as big as the one there. There, as I say, all the all the, um, the aircraft, all our bombers, the hunters. I think there were twelve hunters. I think there were there were six. Canberras, if I'm not mistaken. And then there were, I don't know, probably about 15 vampires. I can't remember what the numbers were. But they were all carrying bombs, and they went in as an advance. They were, the thing was so perfectly timed. What we did was the bombers went in at, at 8 o'clock spot on. Our aircraft were behind them. The bombers actually overtook us. Our air, we jumped at, at 30 seconds past 8, and the first paratroopers came out, and we formed a, start, a sweep line, and we just swept through, and these guys didn't know what had hit them. But, I mean, they were being bombed by every aircraft in the Rhodesian Army, and every, everywhere they tried to run, there was a stop group waiting for them. And that was a bloody audacious because, as I said, 144 men, we took on a camp which we knew of 3,000 in that camp. So you must know that after our briefing, and uh, nobody knew this, this was going to go ahead. We didn't. We'd done a lot of the work and actually wrecking the place. Thing. We had no idea what the plan was. 
and we were pulled into uh, New Serum, which was a, which was an Air Force uh, base. We knew something was happening because you know we'd been all in town. We'd been doing um, rehearsal training and retraining, and you know, a lot of medics. You know, I was I'd been trained as a as a number of things. I was, one of the courses I did was advanced combat medics. So we were being retrained on putting up drips and, you know, sort of stitching things up and putting bandages on and stopping bleeding and, you know, all, all mock-up stuff, but getting the picture and making sure that we were all on the ball. So we knew something big was brilliant, but nobody knew quite what. And then all of a sudden, one afternoon, we were kicking around camp with nothing to do, and they said, right, fall in! And everybody had to appear, and they said, right, stand to, on the trucks. So we had to grab our kit. Our kit had been ready, waiting for a couple of days, and we got on board of these trucks and taken into New Serum, and we were taken into a hangar, and in the middle of this hangar was this massive paper mache model of the entire area, and we had bleachers all around this thing. We sat there, we were given the briefing of what we were about to do. <laughs> so any questions, the one guy stood up and said, is it too late to put in an application for leave? <laughs> I think it was the kind of thing a lot of people were thinking. But it's actually quite amazing because you talk about shitting yourself. If you wanted to go and take a dump anywhere that night, you had no chance because the toilet, there was a queue. All the, <laughs> nobody slept. Well, they, because once we knew what we were in for, I mean, none of the, no, no, none of us were rookies. Eh? We all sort of experienced combat, one sort or another. But this was something which was big. And in terms of doing a combat jump, what's that like? Frightening. You know, you get... It varies, I suppose. My perspective was the jump is done at a very low level. We jump at 500 feet because you don't want to be in the air for any longer than is absolutely necessary. So it takes about 200 feet for your chute to deploy, and then you need time to sort of think about where you're going to put your feet down. So 500 feet is about as low as you can go. You can probably go to 400, but you're really pushing the edges in. We went out at 500 feet. Getting on board the aircraft, knowing what we knew, you know, there's, there's a mindset to it, John. You, you accept these things. We knew... But certainly the SAS guys, you know, there's, there's this whole thing. I always said, oh, the SAS guys, they were fearless. Bullshit. Nobody was fearless. Anybody who tells you he's fearless in a situation like that is either lying to you or he's actually got no bloody brains because, you know, you've got to have some kind of an imagination. And it is. I mean, it's a terrifying feeling, but you've actually got to try and get down on top of that. And one of the things that we were also part of the training in the early stages was combat psychology, and we had a psychologist who used to come and give us lectures. And he had a big thing, and, and this was one of the things that I think quite a few guys were actually sort of told that they weren't, or weren't wanted. Fear is an emotion. It's like love or hate or any other emotion that you – and you've got to be able to control it. If you don't control it, it will control you, and that will lead to panic. Panic breeds panic. Now, all this sort of shit was done in the so – if you're in a situation where you are frightened and you're going to be frightened and you're going to be frightened out of your bloody wits, you've got to sit down and take yourself by the hand and, and, and talk to yourself. Because as soon as fear controls you, you're in shit. So you've got to actually get on top of it and, 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 and control it. So, and I think we were all in varying degrees. We talk about controlling fear. Well, I don't know how controlled you are. If you can continue to function while shitting yourself, I suppose you're controlling it. At that point, it's not controlling you. Because the, the first sign of fear controlling you is when you panic, breeds on itself. It's a frightening experience, but one which you've got to learn to control. You've got to understand you've got a job to do. Now, fear takes different forms and, 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 and different intensity. The time that you fear the most is before you get there, because that is the anticipation of it. And this anticipation starts to create images in your mind and you start to imagine things. And um, Once you're on the ground and the shit has hit the fan and you, you know, you're groveling and you've got rounds flying around your head, that is a time when, strangely enough, it's almost like a calming effect because your mind comes right and you start to coordinate your head and your heart and you can work out where you are and what you're doing. And it, it just, it's a strange phenomenon, but it's, it's something which in combat while you are there, it's never as bad as it is while you're waiting. Now, Ian, you were actually wounded in combat. Can you tell us about that experience and how that impacted you, both physically and mentally? I was actually bloody lucky. 
to be perfectly honest. Very un- unlucky, unlucky. I mean, at the same time, it, was, it could have gone either way. I mean, we were down the southeast, down right down in the sort of southeast part of Rhodesia because there had been a massive influx of bad guys coming across the border into the Mabaluta, into the Gondorazo area. And we were just wrapped in their, their supply lines and their access lines and things like that. We'd gone out and we'd been out for about 10 days. We'd laid a lot of mines along various roads. We were basically just lying up because we had intelligence coming back uh, that vehicles were actually headed in that direction. They were, and, and there were quite a few of them. So we went and we laid a few mines in the road and then set up an ambush. During the day, if you're in an ambush position, you actually more or less stay there all the time. At night, you put say, sentries out and then they you know, shake up everybody. You can go and have a sleep. And we were forced to sleep. And suddenly we've got, come on, come, 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 and shake. And I got up and I loosened my chest webbing. We used to wear um, what called chest webbing. We used to wear magazine pouches across your chest as opposed to in your belt and things. Much easier to carry. And I'd loosened my chest webbing because I had a bloody bucket just sticking into me and I was sort of shaking it off. I grabbed my rifle, but then my chest webbing started to flop around. So I had to pull it back and pull it back up again you know, to tighten it so it wasn't flapping around. And I probably lost about 10 meters on the guys because we were we were about 100 meters from the road. So now the guys are moving forward, running forward to go to get to the road. And there was a sort of a bend in the road just to the left of us. We were approaching it. These vehicles came and their headlights shone straight onto us. Now, they wouldn't have seen us, but I mean, it's thick bush. So as I say, they wouldn't have seen us because they would just have seen into the bush. And images in the bush are really indiscernible. You can't see them. So we wouldn't have been seen, but obviously the, the thought of these headlights shining through the bush directly onto us gave us that appearance. So everybody went to ground. We were leopard crawling forward. First vehicle went past because we wanted to we hoping to hit the mine. And then the second vehicle came past and everybody opened up. And whoever was on the back of that vehicle responded bloody quickly because almost immediately our guys opened up. And I was behind. I was leopard crawling forward. I got hit in, and I got hit in the foot. Now, you know how embarrassing that is. <laughs> So if you're going to get shot, get shot convincingly, you know. It was just before Christmas. We'd been in the bush for about, bloody, we'd been out there for about three and a half weeks, and I get shot in the foot. Well, I mean, you know, there's no mercy when something like that happens. But, you know, oh, Mackenzie, you know, you <laughs> we, you wanted to be home for Christmas, China. You know, we know all about you. Shot yourself in the foot. But having said that, you know, the way I was leopard crawling forward, where that hit me, my foot had been an inch forward, it would have missed. If the round had been an inch to the left, it would have hit me in the head. You know, it was just a completely random shot. The guy didn't aim it. it was, he, was, he just returned fire very quickly. He must have been quite an alert guy. Because, you know, in the back of those vehicles, people who normally sit there, they're fast asleep most of the time. But whoever it was who fired off the round that hit me, must have been quite wide awake. Because it was almost immediately our guys opened up, the return fire came down on us. And I thought I'd been hit from behind, but I knew nobody was behind me. And I also, I couldn't I couldn't fire because people were ahead of me. And I couldn't see where they were. So you know, normally, if my chest webbing hadn't been bloody flopping around, I hadn't had to pull it up, I would have been in line with everybody else. We would have been right up top there and obviously closer to the road. And I would have been able, pretty aware of where everybody else was. But I knew that there were guys ahead of me. So I couldn't fire. And I knew that I, I didn't think there was anybody behind me. But I, all of a sudden, my foot just felt as though it exploded. It wasn't. I mean, the thing went straight through. It broke two bones in my foot. We basically shattered them. I, I could still walk on it because we had to walk out of there. And I, suddenly, we re, we, we'd taken on what we thought was five vehicles. There turned to be 15 vehicles. And these guys were cross. Eh? So they then started to fire back into the bush. I mean, you could see that. And it was... You know, we could actually, they were giving themselves away all the time because, I mean, they just kept on firing. You could see where the tracer was going. It was miles away from where we were. And we were basically, and we had to head up and get out of the area because they were now putting in uh, sweep groups and things like to come and look for us. And, I mean, I wasn't that seriously injured that I couldn't walk. I wouldn't have to be stretched out or anything like that. But shat on because the officer was in charge of all things and said, listen, give somebody else your burger. We used to carry what they called a burger, which is a huge backpack. And on it, you know, we used to have our rations, we'd have our... You know, a medic's kit in my case, you'd have your sleeping bag, carry a book because, you know, in your maps. Or, so it was quite a heavy piece of equipment, and we all, and we all carried them, probably carrying about, I don't know, about 35, maybe 40 kgs in that bag. And when we were out on a long job like that, we all carried them because you had to have, you know, as I say, 
your food, your water, your whatever extra ammo that you carried. In terms of the food, what type of food were you carrying? We used to get rat packs, which used to come in boxes. But no, obviously, nobody used to carry the boxes. We used to take out what we wanted. Um, my staple diet was bully beef and rice. That's what, and other guys had different preferences. But in a particularly in sensitive situation, you can't cook. Uh, so we used to get tinned bully beef, but we used to get these packets of rice. So what I used to do, certainly, and, and a couple of other guys did the same sort of thing, but certainly from my perspective, get a fork and just punch holes in the, in the packet. Then chuck your rice into the tin of water, which doesn't smell. So there's no odor that's going to spread out to some guy thinking, you know, <laughs> He was cooking there. And then the, the rice would swell inside the bag you know, as it cooked. And then you could actually just empty out a tin of, of a bully beef and put it in and mix the whole lot in. So you used to warm the bully beef. And, and then you could put your coffee into the, into the water that you just cooked your rice in. I put a coffee bag in there. My stable diet, you know, you, you never really had sort of meal time, so to speak. But we used to get orange segments and grapefruit segments in little tins. And we used to always carry them. Everybody had a little tin open. And then you wore around your neck. It was one was about this size. And had a little edge on it. You just, uh, once you learned how to use one of those things, it was actually amazing. It was so useful. I mean, you could not do without it. You know, then pilchards. The only worst thing about pilchards is if you get within 100 meters of anybody, it's, like, it stinks. Because <laughs> so, but it was unlikely anybody was going to get that close to us. So we didn't do much. But the, the food we used to get both the base camp, you know, four base camps were, we, we, we never used to operate, well, occasionally we did, operate directly out of Salisbury, out of our barracks. We would go and, and set up base at a Ford base camp somewhere close to where we are going to be operating. For example, if we knew that there was a particular, whatever, whatever situation was there we were there to deal with, we would be close enough to be within chopper range, also close enough to be in reinforcement range and things like that. So we'd, we'd set up base camps. The first thing that always used to go up to the base camp was a kitchen. And they had these uh, gas stoves and paraffin deep freeze and things like that. And a guy from the catering corps always came with us. So the meals we used to get in the bush were unbelievable. I mean, they really were. And I, I think it applied across the board. I don't think we were singled out. But the food that we got in barracks was, I mean, it was restaurant stuff. It was amazing. It was always cooked by, you know, because they had a catering corps. Guys used to go... Where we were learning how to fiddle with weapons and things like that, they were learning how to cook food and, and make it tasty and good. And, I mean, what we used to get in our dining hall was amazing stuff. It was never dealt on these fark panas we used to get in the South African army. And that was, it was on, on white plates with serviettes and tablecloths. And that was our, our mess. And then going out into the bush in, in Ford Base Camp, you, know, you get a, a breakfast with sausages and mushrooms and bacon and eggs and whatever you wanted. It was all there. You know, on deployment, you were, you know, you were dependent on your rations. And if you're in a long deployment, they used to resupply us. You'd resupply us at night by Dakota. They'd send parachute stuff into us. Deployments varied. Sometimes we were out as long as eight weeks, depending on what we had to do. Other occasions, we were out for a couple of days. But we were on a long deployment where we would be totally cut off from anything. Obviously, they had to resupply us. And then they send a DAC in at night, and we would move three or four kilometers away from where we were bivvied up, and then they'd guide the, the, the DAC in. And, I mean, those pilots, I mean, their map reading capabilities were absolutely astonishing. So they would come in and, you know, we'd guide them in, say, so okay, go left, go left, go right, roll out, okay, green light on, go. And then they'd chuck their shit out and, you know, by parachute. When we were in, in very dry areas, they had set in an entire crate of water bags, for example. And then we had hide all that stuff and then systematically move it back to wherever it was that we were basing up. For example, if we were doing a, a long camp um, uh, observation, you know, we were moving around a lot. You know, they would resupply us with explosives, for example. Now, on one occasion for, for four weeks, we spent doing nothing but laying landmines on, on roads, on tar roads in Mozambique. And what we used to do is you go in and, and, and dig up the tar. And underneath the tar, the sand is actually quite soft. And then we'd move the, move the slab of tar back and cover it up and camouflage it and then disappear. And most of those used to get hit. And bear in mind that there was very little civilian traffic on those roads. It's all military. It was either, either Zanla moving around or for Lima. So we spent a lot of time on that kind of operation. But we couldn't carry, you, know, you can only carry so much. So we couldn't carry 30 or 40 mines amongst, you know, sort of eight or nine that. In ops like that, we would actually work in four-man course on, but we would team up. So there would be 
eight four-man course lines working together, then we could actually split away and cut away and so on. You know, and, you know some of those long deployments did. We, we always had more than our four-man course sign, but each course sign was separate from the rest of the group. And then we would work together. For example, we would move away and go and disappear and then to go and do whatever job we were doing. Then we would come back, but we'd only go with four men. And another, you know, there was another occasion where we had – the shuttle, what they call the shuttle clock heroes, and we formed a base on Kabora Bass on an island just to, okay, with canoes. And then every night we used to go in onto the mainland, there were camps all over the place, and go and disrupt the, the activities or whatever was going on in those camps and then pull out and come back, row back to our little island and then hold up there. So Ian, looking back now, is there anything you would have done differently or would you have liked to have changed in hindsight? Yeah, you know, John, it's, I, I, I think, put it this way, if I knew what I know now, I probably would never have gone to Redugia. There are, I think there are regrets, no, not regrets that I could ever have made any difference to. You know, things that happened due, during the period were really beyond the control of the average soldier. No, I don't, I don't really know that there was anything that, that happened that I would actually change. But I think that had I been a little bit more mature and a little bit more responsible, I probably would have allowed my craving for adventure to be satiated by doing something more productive. But having said that, and it's not an experience I regret, I, lo- I made very good friends and lost a lot of them through combat. The kind of thing that we, you know, we have reunions every every year down in Durban. There's a there's a SAS association reunion, and officially known as the Squadron. That was, you know, C Squadron Indigenous Special Air Services. Everybody just knew it as the squadron. So the squadron has its reunions once a year down in Durban. Um, and the reason for that is because when the breakup of, of, of Rhodesia happened and the, the unit was disbanded, an incentive was offered to all of us uh, to come down and spend a year in the, in the South African Army using our experience, using our expertise and things like that. And on that basis, we could get all our pension out, we could get all our furniture out, we could get and all at the expense of the government. But there were, there were guys who were married. There were guys who had children. They could get them all out. And they formed what they called 6th six, six Reconnaissance Commando, which was, which was at the Bluff in Durban. The SAS headquarters ended up being in Durban. So that's where we always have our reunions. It's absolutely amazing how the bond that you form under those conditions is just something which is like a rock. It doesn't move. The bond is, is, is something which is it's indescribable. Particularly the guys who are on selection uh, with you, you know, this, you go through your initial training together, then you end up in a combat unit together, and you end up you know, watching each other's backs and things like that. It's amazing how without is, is, it's unspoken, it's, 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 it's just there. Now, Ian, and being in an elite combat unit such as yourself, and you guys spearheaded a lot of the action in, in Rhodesia, do you think that impacted the guys afterwards? Yes, it did. There are there are guys to this day. In fact, I've recently helped edit a book of one of the guys who I I didn't know because he he came in very late in the, in the day towards the end of the war. And towards the end of the war, we were very very busy. When the squadron was formed into a regiment, we used to have A and B troop, and then they had A, B, and C squadron. So A, B. And the different squadrons operated in different areas. But in the early days, frequently all the squadrons were in town together. And so everybody knew everybody else. We were all one big happy family. Everybody knew each other. And then as time went on, we split those those squadrons up. You know, A squadron would never be in the same town, same time as B squadron or C squadron. We never got to know the newer guys coming in, you know, new trainees and new new recruits, new blacks coming. And this guy was a chap who, he eventually suffered a serious mental breakdown. He ended up in a mental home in, in Scotland. He was affected by the war. He had a, he had a couple of very bad incidents, um, and that, I think, stuck with him. But he was a very successful farmer in the Shamba area. When Mugabe's thugs, these war veterans, decided they were going to come, he was being threatened. And he was at a wedding, and he got a call from his foreman saying, don't come back. They are waiting for you. And he left the country in the suit he was wearing to the wedding. That was it. He, he left everything behind, never to go back. And that broke him, broke his, broke his heart, broke his family. The effects that he, uh, that he felt as a result of the PTSD that he was suffering from anyway, added to that, just, just crippled him, broke him. Now, so, yeah, there are those incidents, those kind of incidents. 
I like to think that I was never affected by it, but I'm told by my wife, I don't bullshit, man. Of course you're affected by the war. You wouldn't be like you are if you weren't, you know, so. You know, you <laughs> but, yeah, no, I don't believe that I was um, psychologically affected by it. I think there are a lot of guys who were not. And I think it depends on your psyche. It depends on, on how easily you can roll with the punches, how easily you can come back from very scary situations, or, or whether you're not going to sort of allow yourself to fall into them and become part of them. I think there definitely were people affected. I think in any war, you know, I mean, you, you've got people coming back from the First World Wars of a shell shock and never, ever recovered from it. I mean, they were kids when they went there and they came back. By the time they died as old men, they were still suffering from the problem. I mean, what, what, what was called shell shock then and then became battle fatigue and did all sorts of new names, eventually became post-traumatic stress disorder. I think any war, wartime situation, the kind of things that you see, the image, you know, the, what, you, what you're stuck with. Now, when we went into that Chamoyo raid and we eventually got into the main camp, I mean, we had to fight our way in there. There was a lot of a lot of people died, and fortunately not on our side. But when we got in that camp, we saw the effects of that those bombs that they had dropped on there. And that's a horrible sight to see for for anybody. But you know, I wasn't you know I, I'd already done advanced medics course at that stage. Part of the advanced medics course, one of the first things they do is they give you let you go and work in a morgue for three days. You know, this is the kind of training, that, I must say, the sort of hands-on training that Rhodesia did. So we actually had to witness that. And those who decided, no, 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 hang on a sec, they were chucked off the course before we started. The whole idea being, listen, guys, you're going to be a medic, you're going to see dead people, and you're going to see blood, and you're going to see guts. If you can't take it, then you're wasting your time even trying. Uh, but I think, yes, definitely, like in any war, there were, there were some serious psychological casualties, if not physical casualties. When we were back in town, you know, when we weren't on ops, so we used to get R and R, so you know, rest and recuperation. Used to come. So we'd go and we'd get ten days R and R. We used to get a lot of leave. The social life in Salisbury and Bulawayo and anywhere else, the social life was absolutely more than you can ever imagine. As incredible, I used to pour liquor down my throat like there's no tomorrow. But the social life, we even in those farm clubs, rural areas, every farming community had a club. And you used to, you know, walk around with a weapon in your hands. Everybody was armed. You know, a wartime situation where you'd walk into the pub and there were rifle racks along the wall. You'd go and put your rifle in a, in a rack and go and order yourself a beer. The, the, the people of Rhodesia was actually what made that country because they were a breed apart. I mean, they were unbelievable, just, just so full of hope, so full of optimism, so full of, you know, spice of life. It's a way of life, John. You, I, I've, I've never come across anything like it anywhere at any time. It was just the most remarkable place. And, you know, when the sun shone, which it did most of the time, it smiled. And another thing about Rhodesia was that the place was efficient to a fault. If there was a, an incident, a military incident, where somebody had ripped up the road because they put a bloody bomb in it or something, which happened, the very next day there'd be a crew out there, you know, being supported by military, they'd be fixing that road. I was there for my own purposes. I mean, I'm not going to try and bullshit anybody. Now I went there because I was dying for the sense of adventure to try and satiate this Walter Mitty bloody mentality that I suffered from and so on. It was only when I was, was had been living there for a time and had experienced the actual Rhodesia experience, had it been sustained, it would have been worth every drop of blood spilt because it was a it was just the most remarkable place that you could ever imagine living in. Now, Ian, thanks very much for sharing your story with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I have to say, it must have been absolutely terrifying doing some of those things you did. It's just so hard to comprehend and imagine what it's like jumping into a combat zone. So thank you for explaining and taking us through some detail because it's, it's quite fascinating for someone like myself to listen and understand some of these difficulties it must have been to be you know, in an elite unit such as the Rhodesian SAS. So thanks very much for sharing your story with us. We will now play the last post. This piece of music was originally played in military camps to mark the end of each day and announce that all soldiers should be resting. The last post symbolizes that the duty of the dead is over and that they can rest in peace. During this time, you might like to close your eyes and think about 
all the men and women who have served in times of war and conflict and about those who have died. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. <laughs>